All right, if you'll take your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at uh, Washington State University. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our event this evening, which is our sixth annual Media and Politics Symposium, which we annually host with the Murrow College of Communications here at WSU. Tonight's event also serves as part of the Foley Institute series of events on the incoming Trump administration. Um, we have, uh, and I'm just going to give you one pl short plug right now, our next event in that series is actually tomorrow at noon at the Foley Institute. We have uh, Bartow Elmore from Ohio State University who will be talking about Trump and the environment, so I encourage you to come out to that. But we kicked off this series of events last week with a keynote from Paul Pearson, the University of California at Berkeley. And I noted last week that it's not an overstatement to say that the transition we're witnessing between the Obama administration and the Trump administration is as stark as any in recent history and has left many Americans feeling somewhat disoriented by the pace and nature of the change. Some cheering and others are protesting that uh, change. The third week of the Trump administration, uh, the controversy surrounding both President Trump and his behavior, but also the policies of his administration show no signs of abating. President Trump's relationship with the news media is especially fraught. While all presidents have complained about media coverage, Mr. Trump has recently labeled the news media the opposition party, and he regularly criticizes journalists for being dishonest and even blackballs uh, news organizations which he perceives to be too critical of him and his administration. To help us make sense of the Trump administration and the news media, we have with us tonight some distinguished speakers. Unfortunately, Scott McClellan, who was George W. Bush's White House press secretary and had planned to be here this evening, his flight out of Seattle was canceled because of the weather, and so he is unable to be here, but he sends his regrets, and we are rescheduling his visit for a later date. Fortunately, however, we do have with us two other distinguished scholars who can provide critical insight into the Trump presidency and its relationship with the news media. Matt Isabasoa is a professor and chair of the political science department at the University of North Texas. Matt received his PhD in political science from Texas A&M University, and he writes extensively about American politics and the mass media. His 2006 book, The President's Speeches Beyond Going Public, explored how presidential speeches impacted the implementation of public policy in the United States. His most recent book, Breaking Through the Noise, Presidential Leadership, Public Opinion, and the News Media, was published by Stanford University Press. And in it, he examines how the president's management of news media provides an important avenue for leadership of the public. Our other speaker tonight is Joseph Yusinski, who's an associate professor of political science at the University of Miami. Joe received his PhD in political science from the University of Arizona and he has written extensively about the role of the news media and elections. His first book, The People's News, examined how audience demand drives the content of news coverage. His most recent book, American Conspiracy Theories, authored with Joseph Parent, examines how and why people believe in political conspiracy theories. Moderating tonight's discussion will be my colleague from the Murrow College, uh, uh, Poris, Porismita Bora, Pori received her PhD in journalism and mass communications from the University of Wisconsin, and she is currently an assistant professor of journalism here at WSU. Her research focuses on emerging technology in the context of politics, and her work has appeared in the leading journals of mass communications. Currently, Pori also serves as the head of communication technology division of the National Association of for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication. Joining me now in welcoming our guests, and I'll turn the time over to Pori. and then we'll open it up for uh, question and answers. Um. Good evening. Thanks to Cornell for that nice introduction. Thanks to Washington State University and the Foley Institute for having me, and thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Matt Eshbal Soha. I'm at the University of North Texas. I'm going to talk about the presidency in the news media, and that uh, subtitle there is a nod to Bruce Lee fans. Enter the Donald. <laughs> it's 
so the history of the presidency and the news media, I think, uh, can be illustrated in, in a number of ways. Generally speaking, when we talk about the presidency and the media, often we're talking about antagonism and mutual benefit. And as we'll get to, I think that antagonism certainly appears to be the strategy of Donald Trump, but I'll still illustrate considerable evidence that mutual benefit is uh, likely to be a more effective strategy for, uh, for President Trump. And I'd like to begin these uh, conversations about the relationship between the presidency and the news media with a quote um, to illustrate this longstanding uh, antagonism between uh, the presidency and the media. And uh, this particular president, and, and think about who this president might be, often I, I open this up to uh, uh, guesses from the audience, but think about who may have said these words. And this president talked about the coverage of his governance displayed all the invective that disappointment, ignorance of facts, and malicious falsehoods could invent to misrepresent my policies. Now most people say, oh, that's probably Richard Nixon. Maybe Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, could be President Obama, but in fact, that was George Washington. The antagonism between the news media and the presidency has existed since the founding. Now it's changed over time as media have evolved from partisan to yellow journalism to objective and then back to partisan journalism again. But what strikes me about this quote is it is illustrative of the early, and we're only a few weeks into it, their early days of the Trump presidency. President-elect's first press conference was striking. Not only did Donald Trump's press secretary lambast the media, his vice president-elect repeated those charges, and the president-elect himself said it once again. Now, all presidents since George Washington disliked the news media. It was astounding to see a first press conference by a president-elect begin with a criticism in the news media. So I'll, I'll look at this particular question as, if, is this Donald Trump's strategy for dealing with the media, and will this be an effective strategy? Uh, part of the reason why I'm talking about the other half of the equation, mutual benefit, is that I don't think it will be a sustainable strategy, but right now that appears to be the case. Most presidents dislike the media but understand the necessity for mutual benefit, okay? That the president needs the media to reach the public. And ultimately, the public is a vehicle in a democracy to help the president achieve his goals when he may not have overwhelming support in Congress, uh, when he might try to do something that other politicians are reticent to support. So presidents um, try to influence the news media to encourage them to talk about his agenda with the end result of leading public opinion and hopefully to help him achieve his policy goals. So you can't see that this well, but basically you can make out enough of this declining graph. And this is a graph of trust in news media. Okay, this is about 1999, about 54% in 2003. We're down to about 30% of Americans trust or have confidence in the news media. So clearly this is what, you know, keeping in mind that polls aren't always accurate or believable, this provides some evidence of, the, of the, the reason behind Donald Trump's strategy, is that most Americans are predisposed to doubt what news media report anyway. So why not begin by raising questions about the intermediary, about the media, uh, and instead of trying to work through them, perhaps criticize them instead. Now this graph here, uh, this dark line here shows Republican support, as you can imagine, that's about 14%. 30% for independents, Democrats, 51%. And this is consistent with our general perceptions of, of, of liberal bias in the media, uh, that Republicans are, are more likely to uh, mistrust the news media. So the reason why I show this is that even though a third of Americans don't trust the media, uh, most of this is driven by Republicans. And traditionally, keeping in mind that the Trump presidency might be different, traditionally presidents have to govern across more than just um, satisfying their partisan base. Indeed, with a president who did not win the popular vote, uh, struggled to uh, win a plurality in the popular vote, 
The Trump administration needs to look at this carefully to decide if there's going to be enough support in terms of attacking the news media to be able to win re-election in four years. Okay, mutual benefit. Let's, so let's say that the antagonism is, is Trump's strategy. Um, most presidents have, gained in a, have engaged in a strategy of mutual benefit, understandably antagonistic in their own ways, ways to circumvent the media, ways to reach the public directly. It hasn't usually been as critical as the Trump administration has been thus far. But in this, in this way of trying to use the media to reach the public, presidents engage in a number of strategies. And one of these is through national addresses, which have declined over time in terms of their frequency. Uh, fewer people watch, and this is important. But national addresses are one way that presidents can circumvent the news media if they choose to, speak directly to the American people, which can be an effective strategy if there's a large audience. And even when there's not a large audience, presidents tend to be fairly successful. What this graph shows is, over time, an increase in news coverage related to illegal drugs, this particular arrow showing George H.W. Bush's national address on illegal drugs in 1989. And what you can see clearly is that national address led to a significant increase in news coverage of the president's topic, his policy concerns about uh, illegal drugs. So presidents, and what we see also, if I could show you the public opinion data, was that the public was responsive to this, that the public began to think that illegal drugs were an important problem and both of these factors often set the stage for presidents to achieve policy success if they uh, continue to pursue that idea. So national addresses can be effective. They're not always effective in increasing news coverage or affecting public opinion, but about 40% of the time we do see national addresses increasing news coverage. They tend to wane uh, pretty quickly, as you can see here. If the, unless the president continues to talk, the news media get distracted, they focus on other things, in terms of the impact on public opinion as well, as news media focus on something else, the public thinks about other things. The president tends to have a significant impact on increasing public support among those who watch the address, but few people are watching presidential addresses. What's more, increasingly, national addresses, one reason why they're not being used as much as they were, say, in the Reagan years, uh, was that it's supporters who watch the president. So presidents speak on national television, they're effectively preaching to the choir, right? So we need to find another way for presidents to reach out to a broader audience. But basically, national addresses in consultation with the news media to get airtime, the fact that news media will cover it can be a fairly beneficial strategy for presidents. Another strategy presidents can use is going local, and if, if Scott, Scott McClellan were here, he could speak to this directly. One of the most uh, concerted efforts to try to affect policy change by, by going around the Washington press corps, which tends to be mostly negative, critical presidents, there's no question, N news coverage is negative. That's why Wash George Washington said what he said. That's why you can imagine virtually any president saying roughly the same thing that George Washington said. News coverage of presidents is negative. So George W. Bush decided, okay, I need to build public support for my Social Security reform plan. I'm going to go, I'm going to ignore the Washington press corps. They can come along if they want to. But I'm going to go to 60 places around the nation in 60 days to try to build support for Social Security reform. And what we know from this strategy and other studies that look at what we call going local, going around the national news media to local media, uh, is that it does lead to more coverage of the president. It does lead to more positive coverage of the president. But unfortunately, a lot of the local news coverage is not about the policy. You usually get one story in there. But the other six or seven are about the, you know, the local elementary school field trip to see the president, right? Or that the president stopped at you know, local establishment and his favorite food was the breakfast burrito or what have you. So very descriptive, interesting, fun to read, but not very effective in terms of governing. So presidents can, there's some benefit to this, but as you can see here, without a discussion of, of policy, public support, even as the president kept talking and visiting, it dropped, okay? So a good strategy for increasing news coverage, but it tends to be fairly superficial and it doesn't have 
uh, the impact that presidents might like. So another example of presidents trying to circumvent the media and have it, having limited success. There are also direct exchanges with media. We saw the press conference with uh, President Trump. We see the press briefings daily. But presidents can certainly bring the news media together. News media want opportunities to speak to the president. There's, you know, every Washington correspondent wants that opportunity to ask a question, right? That's good for their reputation and their standing. Some see this as risky, right? You can have an off the cuff remark that can drive news coverage, okay? Barack Obama gave a press conference in July of 2009 about healthcare reform. The subsequent news coverage, even though 90, 5% of the questions, virtually all but one question, was about health care reform. The subsequent news coverage wasn't about that because President Obama commented on the arrest of Professor Lewis Gates in Cambridge, said that was the police acted stupidly. That drove the news coverage. You make one little mistake and it goes awry. It can be even more superficial than that. In Labor Day weekend of 2013, President Obama gave a press conference in which he wore a tan suit. What was the news coverage about? It's about what's up with that suit. Okay, so you have to be careful. But there are opportunities here. Presidents know what reporters are going to ask. That's the press secretary investigating this on a daily basis, figuring it out. Um, moreover, the news tends to report the, pres report the president's own words. If it's carefully choreographed and if presidents stay on message, they're likely to you be able to use that as a vehicle to reach the public and certainly... Um, generate some news coverage. And of course, solo press conference tends to be more newsworthy. These are more valued, they're less frequent. Uh, it's not the same as a joint press conference as we saw uh, a week ago with Donald Trump. You can also engage in media interviews, right? We don't know a lot about this. We do know presidents will reach out, the White House will reach out to news organizations to hold interviews to try to explain policy decisions especially when it's complicated, you can sit down and you have more of an opportunity to go through the process, the thought, as opposed to relying on news media to give a, uh, a, you know, a seven second soundbite on, on the evening news. But we don't know how, how effective this can be. We, certainly it benefits uh, the president on that network. So if the president gives an interview on CNN, well, CNN is gonna cover that. Donald Trump gave an interview to Bill O'Reilly yesterday. It was on Fox and certainly Fox has been trumpeting it. Uh, as well. Uh, and if it's newsworthy enough, it might generate discussion elsewhere. And again, this provides the opportunity for presidents to be a little bit more substantive. Now we have Donald Trump. And what's interesting about the Trump campaign and the Trump presidency is I've gotten in the habit of trying to qualify what I think I know. Okay, we think we know how things work, but Donald Trump seems different certainly defied expectations in the campaign, has taken a more forceful antagonistic strategy in de dealing with the media. So our expectations, I think these generalizations that I'm talking about are likely to maintain themselves, but we'll have to wait and see if these previous strategies, if, pre if President Trump engages in them, how he engages in them, and, and if he does, then we would expect that they would have similar results as we've seen for past presidents. But a new wrinkle to the Trump communication strategy is social media generally and more particularly Twitter, right? This is, um, you know, as a political scientist, we watch, we see tweets, we think, oh yeah, there's a huge effect. But as a political scientist, I'm gonna wait until we can collect the data and see whether it's been effective. Sometimes we, we draw conclusions that are inaccurate because we don't have enough information. So it may have been effective. We'll have to wait and see whether tweets are driving news coverage, whether tweets are influencing public opinion in one way or another, right? This would be a major coup for the presidency if they could use something like Twitter to bypass the media and reach the public directly. But I would caution and say that this is what the national address was designed to do. This is what going local was designed to do, and even those strategies uh, didn't have the, the benefit that perhaps presidents would like. We don't know a lot about Twitter. What we do know with a lot of newer media, social media, is that there's not a lot of, there's a lot of self-selection, okay? If you're on Twitter 
and you like politics, if you like Donald Trump, you're probably going to follow him. But a lot of people don't like politics, right? We, we're lucky to get 60% turnout in, in presidential elections. Local elections in, in my uh, town of, of Denton, Texas, we get, we're lucky to get 5%. We've got a city council election coming up, 5%. That is, that's the goal. If we get more than 5%, we're going to be really happy. Americans aren't interested in politics. With new media, the internet, cable, you can opt out. You don't have to watch that. So a lot of the evidence that we know from Twitter related to political engagement is that there's not a lot of a positive benefit. It's people who are already engaged using that, and it sort of reinforces what they already believe and reinforces their involvement in politics. So there's a real question about the potential impact of Twitter. Another question that we have for President Trump is whether he can control the message. One lesson of past administrations is that if you go off topic, you're not going to be effective maintaining news coverage, keeping the public's attention on a key issue, and then being able to translate that into success perhaps in Congress. So can Trump stay on message? Can the White House staff convince him that he needs to focus on a handful of issues, which again, our evidence suggests that's how presidents are successful. Will he be able to uh, do that? Will he be able to rely solely on Fox News Channel to get his message out? Or does he need to broaden his reach uh, to, again, go on 60 Minutes, reach out to other networks that he seems to have a, a, a feud with? Is that going to restrain, is that going to limit his ability to reach a larger segment of society? Now, currently, it seems that he thinks that the antagonistic strategy is going to be successful. Uh, but given that our understanding is that presidents need to broaden their base of support to be successful on policy and re-election, might, he might have to change that. So the real question that I conclude with is, the more things change, the more they stay the same? It could be, right? We have new technology, we have new media, we have Twitter. There's a hope, certainly among Trump supporters, that Twitter allows the president to bypass the media and thus, the antagonism with media is, is not going to be detrimental to the president's communication leadership strategy. But that's an open question. Past strategies to avoid the media, national addresses going local, have had some benefits. Twitter is unlikely of having some benefit for President Trump. But there's limitations there. Often it's a combination of a variety of strategies uh, to try to influence the news media and influence public opinion. So once we can study Twitter effects, we may find that they are more like past media strategies rather than providing President Trump the workaround that will allow him to simply antagonize the media and govern effectively, but rather that he's going to have to engage the media in a more mutually beneficial way so that he can lead the media, eventually the public, and perhaps Congress in such a way that he can achieve those goals that he set out for himself and for the American people in the 26th presidential election campaign. But again, that's an open question. We will have to see. It'll be really interesting. We'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you much for that wonderful presentation. Joe? Joe will speak on fake news and conspiracy theories. So I'm going to talk about three things that are sort of interesting characteristics of 2016 and 2017. And the first is conspiracy theories. Uh, the second is fake news. And the third is um, how do people interact with their information environment? And in particular, you know, how and why are people rejecting, you know, authoritative information in favor of fake, you know, fake news or, or, or bad facts? I want to open up with a, a quick story. I've been working with my university, University of Miami, and they have me doing some talks um, for our alumni. And I was working with a, an outside consulting firm, and we spent months and months working on this talk, and I was talking about fake news. And it's sort of like a TED Talk, if you're familiar with the TED Talks, um, but we call it a cane talk because we're the hurricanes. Um, so I was doing a cane talk, and just like the TED Talks, it opened up with a big picture of a globe and say something very profound. And we had spent months working on this line, and, and uh, it was just perfectly crafted. 
And what the consultant said to me is, after you say this, just pause for three or four seconds and let it sink right into the audience. And you're just going to stun them. So here's the line, and I'm going to tell you what happened. So, <laughs> so I said, imagine a world where truth doesn't matter. And everybody, it was a room of 300 people, they all erupted into laughter. Because they said, we're already there. <laughs> we don't have to imagine this. And it was both sort of shocking that people thought we were in a world where truth doesn't matter, but also good in the sense that they were recognizing that a lot of the information that's out there right now is bogus. So I guess there's some good and in, 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 in bad in that. Um, so I'm going to have to do the talk again, and I think I'm going to switch it and say, imagine a world where truth does matter. Wouldn't you like to be there? And maybe that will work. Um, so three topics, conspiracy theories, fake news, and how people um, like to reject facts. So the first one is conspiracy theories. So the interesting thing in this election is that conspiracy theories sort of dominated our news coverage. And a lot of that I don't put on people. You know, when the media would call me and they say, you know, why are people believing in conspiracy theories more? I said, it's not that they are. And in fact, there's no evidence to suggest that people are more conspiratorial in their thinking in 2016 than they were in 2012. It may be the case, but there's no evidence of it. Um, what there is evidence of is that the media and our political elites are talking in conspiratorial terms quite a bit. And this was largely triggered by two candidates. And the first was Donald Trump, who built a campaign largely around a conspiracy theory that said uh, political elites were selling out Americans to foreign interests. And if you add up all of his conspiracy theories, they all sort of boil down to that. Um, maybe not the, you know, Ted Cruz's father killed JFK one, but that's sort of an outlier. But everything else was, you know, Syrian refugees have cell phones paid for by ISIS. Mexico is purposely sending rapists and murderers to get us and then take our jobs. Um, so if you put all that together, it's sort of this, this neat little package of um, xenophobia combined with, uh, you know, uh, anger at the political class. The other candidate was Bernie Sanders, who also built his campaign largely on a conspiracy theory. And what was interesting is that most people didn't consider, most people in the media didn't consider what he was pushing a conspiracy theory, but to me it clearly fits the bill. He argued that a small group of people had operated in secret to take over our politics and our economics and, to use a few quotes, had a greed that knows no end and was making it hard for us to survive. That group was the 1%. So he said 1% of the country has taken over our economics and politics and we have to fight against them and if you vote for me, I will thwart the 1% and make this a, um, a social democracy. Both, both of them you know, just beyond the conspiracy theory that they had built their campaign around, um, embraced a lot of other conspiratorial thinking, too, during the race. So when Bernie Sanders didn't win, what, is, what, is, what did his campaign say? It was rigged. You know, this happened most particularly in Nevada. Um, same thing with Donald Trump. He said the primaries are rigged, the convention was going to be rigged, and the, <laughs> and the general election vote was going to be rigged. Everything was going to be rigged. And it makes sense for these two candidates to do what they did. It, does, it, it's, it doesn't come as a surprise. You know, I like to use the phrase that conspiracy theories are for losers. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean it in a sort of descriptive sense where people who are on the outside, people who are out of power, um, they tend to latch on to conspiracy theories, in this case, to justify their existence. So why is it that Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump would have to use conspiracy theories? Well, Trump has to justify, why would you put into office a person with no political experience? Why would you put that person in the White House? Well, he needs to give you an, a, a, a reason, and that reason is a conspiracy theory. All politicians are corrupt. Everyone on the debate stage next to him was corrupt. They were all in on it. Um, certainly the Bushes are in on it. And for that reason, you should be supporting the outsider. And if you look at his his RNC convention speech, that's exactly what it is. I'm the only one who can do this because I'm an outsider. The whole inside is corrupt. 
Bernie Sanders did the same thing. You know, he doesn't consider himself to be a Democrat, even though he ran for the Democratic nomination. He's an outsider, said very plainly, I'm a Democratic Socialist, I'm not a Democrat. And he ran to change the entire system, so he had to justify what he was doing. Why are we gonna, you know, not be capitalist anymore? Why are we gonna become a socialist state? Well, here are the reasons, because the entire economy and the entire political system has been bought out by this group of the 1%. So that's why we got that's why we got so many conspiracy theories. Both candidates got about 40% of their party's vote because Bernie Sanders was running against one person instead of I think 22 at one point. Sanders lost and Donald Trump was able to win. So just in that, I mean both parties have equal numbers of people who are drawn to conspiratorial thinking. Um, and both parties have equal number of people who seem to be against the party and want to get somebody from, from outside the party to get the party's nomination. So the question I get asked by the media all the time is, well, if it's not people believing in them, why are we talking about them so much? And, and the reason is simple, is that you have these two candidates pushing conspiracy theories, and then the media jumped on it because it makes great media to talk about conspiracy theories. Everybody loves talking about them. And um, one thing we, we have to distinguish in the media coverage of these conspiracy theories is that it's talking about it is not the same as believing in it. And the vast majority of coverage of these conspiracy theories was incredibly negative. When Donald Trump said, I think Ted Cruz's dad played a part in the JFK assassination. The Washington Post wasn't like, oh my God, get Woodward and Bernstein on this one and we'll track this down. And the vast majority of conspiracy theories that come out from, from Donald Trump now gets immediate pushback. So the media isn't complicit in supporting the conspiracy theories by saying, hey, this might be true. They almost unanimously, the mainstream media says these are false. Um, but they do sort of push these things in the sense that they cover them a lot. And that may have a negative effect because people start to hear about them. Even if the coverage is negative, people start to hear the, um, the coverage of it. So, for example, when, when Justice Scalia died, there was a ton of coverage of the conspiracy theories that popped up. You know, if you remember, they say, oh, they found Justice Scalia with a pillow above his head. So the immediate idea was, well, the pillow was on his head because Obama had put it there and held it. And that, that was not the case. And of course, Donald Trump, I think he went on the Alex Jones show and said, yeah, we need to look into that. Um, and there was a lot of coverage of this by the media saying, why do people believe in these things? But I, I you know, there's one thing to say we want to explain it. It's another thing that, that just by covering it, I think it does give it some breath and some legs which perhaps um, the media should be, should be more careful with. Um, so why do people believe in conspiracy theories? There are two reasons. One is, is dispositional and the other one is situational. So there are two dispositional reasons. Um, one is that people love to point fingers at each other um, and never at themselves. So in 2012, we asked people, um, who do you believe is conspiring against you? And we gave them a list of groups that they could pick from. And Republicans said that liberals and communists were out to get us. And Democrats said that corporations and conservatives were out to get us. And they do it almost in a mirror image, that they never like to point fingers at themselves. It's always fingers um, at the other side. So um, conspiracy theories come equally from both sides of the aisle um, over time. And they just point fingers at each other. Now, the other part of, uh, of dispositional, um, the other dispositional thing going on is that to one degree or another, people are predisposed to believe in conspiracy theories. We all have that friend that believes in every conspiracy theory. If you don't have that friend, then you might be that person. Um, so there are people who will buy into almost anyone and people who are resistant to most conspiracy theories. They believe in very few. Most people are somewhere, um, somewhere in the middle. Um, so what we find is that there are really two, um, um, two, so two things going on that will get us to believe in a conspiracy theory. Um, 
so what it leaves us with is that at most only 25% of the population is going to buy into any political conspiracy theory. So the birther and the truther theories, the idea that George Bush blew up 9-11 or the idea that Barack Obama faked his birth certificate, they maxed out at about 25% because they only got about half their party. And the reason why they only got half their party is only half of each party is into conspiracy logic and is going to buy into it. So 25% buys into birther, 25% buys into truther, 50% of the population doesn't buy into either, and that's sort of the good news, but the bad news is that 50% of the population buys into one or the other, right? So a lot of this just, just comes down to what are people willing to believe in, and generally it's, it's we, we choose if we want to believe in conspiracy theories, and if we do, the other side is, is the conspirator. The other, the other thing going on here is situational. So in 2012, we asked people before the election, if, if your candidate, if the presidential candidate you're supporting doesn't win, will the outcome have been, have been due to fraud? And about 65% of partisans said if their candidate didn't win, it would have been due to fraud, which is a pretty big number of people thinking this. Um, so it sort of says something about our elections. Almost, you know, a majority of people think the other side is cheating, right? A majority think that the other side is up to no good. Um, so elections sort of become this security dilemma where, um, you know, everyone thinks the other side is cheating, and we're not sure exactly how to regulate. You know, and we're running into that now with voter ID laws. We ask people after the election. Um, was the outcome due to fraud, and that number cuts in half, and it's mostly only Republicans who believe that the outcome was due to fraud. Why? Because a Democrat won. So when I say conspiracy theories are for losers, that's exactly what it is. After every election, the side that lost says the other side cheated. There was a recent poll um, asking Americans, you know, do you believe that the Russians rigged the voting machines? 50% of Democrats said yes, but only a small number of Republicans said yes. It's because Democrats lost. So um, that's the situational component. We sort of see that playing out now. In the weeks after the election, we had two competing conspiracy theories. One seemed to be okay. The other one was, was not okay. So after the election happened, there was a recount sponsored by Jill Stein. She raised more than $8 million on the premise that the Russians had hacked the voting machines in certain states. Um, and the Clinton um, campaign supported the, you know, the effort to get a recount in those states. Um, it, it did not go through. And at the same time, you had Donald Trump send out one tweet that said, well, I would have won the popular vote except for those 3 million illegal aliens who voted. And the press went nuts because... Donald Trump said that. Like, he's destroying the integrity of our elections, and that's, you know, that sort of rhetoric is, is not um, good for our democracy. But they seem to turn a blind eye to the, to the idea that the Russians had hacked the voting machines, and there was a recount that was endorsed by the Clinton campaign. That was okay. Why? Because conspiracy theories are for losers. It's okay when the losers say they've been cheated. It's not okay when the winners say it. We just don't accept it when powerful people say they're the victim of shadowy forces. In 1998, when Hillary Clinton went on the Today Show and said, my husband's troubles are due to a vast right-wing conspiracy, it became a laughing stock because we knew that he, Bill Clinton was not the victim of a conspiracy. He was the victim of his bad choices. In 2012, Barack Obama opened up his his uh, re-election campaign with a commercial that asserted that shadowy oil billionaires were out to get him. He didn't even bother airing the commercial on TV. It hit the ground with a thud because it doesn't, that sort of rhetoric doesn't work for the most powerful people. It works for people who are out of power. It works for losers. So what we're going to see over the next four years is that Democrats are going to be pushing the conspiracy theories. They are going to couch a lot of their arguments in conspiracy theories. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It's completely fine because for losers, conspiracy theories act as alarm systems, warning bells. Hey, something's going on here. There's a powerful foe who, who has power over us. He's not one of us. Um, the presidency matters. Politics ain't beanbag. 
So there, Donald Trump has resources, and he is going to distribute those resources, and it's not going to be done in a way that favors Democrats. And they need to be vigilant, and they need to keep an eye on it, and conspiracy theories are one way to do that. It closes ranks. So, uh, second, to second topic is fake news. So we saw a lot of, a lot of attention paid to fake news um, in the 2016 election. Um, I want to give you one example here, and this is the Ebola zombie, and this was big during the Ebola scare of 2013. So we had a couple of cases of Ebola in the U.S., but a lot of cases in Africa, and this made its way around Twitter. It said that... Um, Africans were catching Ebola, dying, and then coming back to life as Ebola zombies. And I think this had, I don't know, off the top of my head, half a million shares on Facebook. And it was featured on Infowars and a couple other sites. So people were scared, oh my God, we're going to get attacked by Ebola zombies. And it makes sense that people would think that, particularly in America, because we love zombies. We have this fascination with zombies here. Um, but as it turns out, that was not actually an Ebola zombie. It was, a, it, it was an extra from a Brad Pitt movie about zombies. Um, so not real. That's just, a, that's just an actor. So, but some people thought that was real, and they freaked out about it. And it just tells you that even dumb ideas can get traction because you know people will sometimes believe in you know ridiculous dumb ideas. Um, Fake news works very well in the U.S. right now, particularly because we have um, we have partisans who have di have divided themselves. So people have their partisan point of view, and then they pick their media based on that. So Republicans will watch Fox, Democrats will watch CNN or MSNBC or NPR. And they will pick their Facebook friends. And a lot of people pick friends who agree with them. And if they find out their friends disagree with them, they unfriend them. This happened quite a bit during the past election. My wife had to block her mother and father-in-law, who she couldn't deal with anymore. <laughs> I blocked them too. <laughs> so I did not blame my wife. <laughs> But I kept my I kept my father-in-law on, um, and he gave me a lot of material for this talk. So, um, so that happened quite a bit, and you had a lot of defriending. Um, so people create their own little bubbles, their own little environments where they can get the news that they want, and then they see things, and then they friend those news sources. And sometimes those news sources aren't very good. They're not re real journalists. One of the great things that the internet has done is democratize journalism. Now anyone can be a journalist. And when you write something, you have the ability now with social media to make it travel you know, farther and faster than ever before, right? So th these are both very good things. They're very democratic, but the problem is that they create this, this environment where now um, people with bad intentions can spread uh, news that they know isn't true, and they know that if it demonizes one side or the other, it will get picked up by one side or the other, right? So during the campaign, we had news going around that said Hillary Clinton was dead. Uh, we had news saying that she was replaced by a body double because she was so ill. Um, and these got tons and tons of shares. Um, it happened on the other side, too, where... Um, just after the election, but before the Electoral College vote, um, a lot of people on the left were sharing a story that said that a, a member of the Electoral College who had six children um, jumped out of a six-story window, decided to take his own life because he couldn't bear the thought of voting for Donald Trump. Um, that was not true. That didn't happen. But a lot of people shared it because it just matched what they already believed. So... We have fertile ground for fake news to go around because it's easy to demonize. Um, it's easy to demonize people with this fake news because people already believe in that. Um, there's something weird on the screen up there that is also keeping me from clicking. It's a yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, 
Another thing I would say, too, is there's a lot of talk right now about fake news, and that's actually a good thing, is that people are pointing out, you know, we don't want fake stuff in our, in our information environment. People are getting hip to it, and, and there's a lot of action taking place. Facebook is trying to clean up the information environment on its platform. Um, Snopes.com is taking a bigger role in, in fact-checking things on the Internet, and fact-checking has been growing uh, for the last few years. So, so those things are playing a bigger role. So we see this reaction to, um, to the spread of fake news. Um, and people actually do care. I think there aren't any, any people out there saying, I want the fake stuff. You know, I think most people want real news. It's just sometimes they get drawn in with the sweetness of things that are, you know, mean to the other side. Um, I would just caution people, you know, Donald Trump says CNN is fake news. He says the Washington Post is fake news. Anything he doesn't like is fake news. Um, and I think we need to define fake news and know what it is. And I try to keep the definition to things that, you know, we know are false before we um, put them out. And it's always going to be the case that our mainstream sources are putting out incorrect news. And the Washington Post, unfortunately, I think is a great news organization, but they've done this a few times. Um, so right after the election, they did a, a story that said um, something to the effect of the Russians have hacked our election and they put on, on this, th this big campaign of misinformation and they cited a source that was very dubious. They said it's this academic group that's been studying this and it turns out the academic group wasn't really real and they didn't have any data. So was that fake news? You know, was, was the Washington Post just falling for this because they really didn't like Donald Trump and they're happy to push the idea that the Russians hacked us? The same thing happened just two or three weeks ago when the Washington Post said, hey, the, uh, the Russians hacked into a power plant in Vermont. And then they had to pull back the story and then they had to pull back the story even more and say, no, they didn't actually um, do that. That, that. that never happened. Um, so there's a lot to think about with fake news. Um, there. And then the final thing I want to talk about is that, th that even when you give people the right information, sometimes they reject facts outright. And there are a lot of social scientific studies that show this. Um, Brennan Nyhan and Jason Reifler have done studies where they show people, you know, here's authoritative evidence that says the health care bill does not have death panels in it. And the people who believe that there is death panels not only reject the authoritative information, but they double down on their wrong beliefs. So we're in a space where, yes, we know it's the right thing to give good information, and we need to do that more and more, and we need to be cognizant that, that what we're sharing is correct on social media. Um, but we also have to be cognizant that sometimes it's futile. People are going to believe what they want to believe, um, whether or it's true or not, and they're not even going to buy the best evidence. So yes, it's on us to, to um, do due diligence as citizens. Don't share fake news. You know, if someone's sharing something fake, point it out. Um, that'll be a good thing. Um, but we have to know that, that we're not going to change minds that much. So maybe that's a down note to leave it on, but I'll, I will leave it there. And, uh, and uh <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Now, actually, I'll start with a few questions for the speakers, and then uh, we can have some break. Uh, can I start with you first? And um, I wanted to ask you, I know you touched upon this a little bit, but um, how is the... Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I was going to ask you about how the current administration's uh, relationship with the press different or similar to previous administrations that you have studied? I know you touched upon that a little bit, but if you wanted to speak a little more. Yeah, well, we only have a few weeks um, of the, the uh, Trump presidency, but yeah, I mean, it started with um, a, a very antagonistic um, drawing a line uh, with the news media. And I, I mean, this is unlike anything that I have seen. Most presidents will bemoan an uncooperative news media. All presidents do this. Uh, George W. Bush called the national, the Washington Press Corps a filter. Uh, the title of my 
second book, Breaking Through the Noise, was borrowed from Barack Obama, who called Fox News essentially noise. So presidents often will criticize the news media. They'll often try to affect um, the news media strategically to try to get the news media to give them more of what they want, right? to, to facilitate that mutual beneficial relationship uh, with a dose of antagonism. But the Trump administration thus far has been entirely antagonistic, except for offering a, you know, a number of interviews with uh, Fox News, Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly. So it, I it is different. Uh, I, again, as I said, I, I suspect that the, the Trump presidency will find that they're going to have to soften. But again, I say that qualifying it because, you know, we've kind of been waiting for Trump to be conventional and he hasn't been. Um, so from, from my point of view, it's interesting to see what he does and then study whether that's been effective, whether it can be replicated by other presidents, um, you know, and what are the costs and benefits of the strategy that he's undertaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you was about um, Trump's use of Twitter. I mm -hmm. know you touched upon that a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but if you can talk about how his use of Twitter, um, you think has had any impact on, his, on, on the voters or as well as the media? In terms of the voters, I think, um, you know, most campaign rhetoric uh, is reinforcing, right? So if you're a Trump supporter, you agree with that, it might motivate you to turn out um, than you would have otherwise. But it's unlikely to have much of an impact on, on support among the electorate or, or public opinion, as I alluded to. And in terms of news coverage, it certainly seems to have had an impact. Uh, but it's not necessarily in the way that perhaps Trump and some of his supporters the administration might like. Usually, Trump tweets. I mean, I, I follow Trump on Twitter, but I, I never check because there's so much to scroll through that I just get overwhelmed and ignore it. So, you know, where do I learn about Trump's tweets? It's through the news, right? CNN, Fox, whatever it might be. So I think that would be an indication, an early indication that Trump, if he's able to drive news coverage, if he's able to shift the conversation, if he's able to use a tweet to get the, the news media to shift their focus, right? John Stewart used to always do this. He'd be like, here's the news media, right? Squirrel, right? Chase whatever. Donald Trump's tweets are that squirrel. Uh, if Trump is able to manipulate the media using Twitter, and that's an open question, I think, but there's some evidence to suggest he's been able to do that, then that's on the media to decide more clearly whether a tweet is newsworthy or not. It's easy, it's entertaining, kind of talking with, about fake news and conspiracy. One thing we know about news media is they focus on soft news, what's entertaining, what's easy for people to understand. We have a policy discussion that's complicated. It's boring. People change the channel. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to look at a tweet and say, okay, let's talk about these 180 characters. That doesn't require a lot of prep. Um, everybody can have an opinion about that, so it can easily drive news coverage. You know, but the question for a, a, a media leadership strategy, is it just fleeting? Can it help Trump build support for different policies, sustain coverage? And then also, is it in the, is it, are the news media going to continue to respond to every tweet? Or are they going to you know, hold Trump to a standard as they would with other presidents and not report on every speech, uh, but report on only those things that perhaps are deemed to be important? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I mean, there was talk about even during the primaries, right, that how he was driving mm -hmm. the news media because of all his tweets and there was yeah. a lot of talk Well, it is that. ironic. I mean, he, he had more free news coverage than, than any other any candidate. Yes. There's a good argument to be made that the media nominated Trump. <laughs> um, so he has yeah. a funny way of showing thanks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 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 all right. Um, Thanks for that. Um, so questions uh, for you, Joe? Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you is um, how can, if academia can play a role in, um, if we can stop the spread of fake news, and uh, if so? <laughs> you know, one question I keep hearing from political scientists, and um, I'm, I'm sure you'll concur with me, is a lot of people saying, how do we teach in the Trump era? How do we teach Trump? And because he's he's been so divisive, 
and that there are some people who just can't handle talking about him at all, and there are a lot of professors who, you know, are just get very upset when I talk about any, anything about him, so they're not sure what to do. Um, academia probably should play a role, mm -hmm. um, and they should probably get more um, more vocal. And they've started to do that over the last decade. So, for example, the Washington Post has a column called The Monkey Cage, which is just um, um, political scientists mostly sharing their work in easy-to-read um, articles. So, you know, when, when people make, you know, when politicians make claims, they can quickly be rebuked by, you know, political scientists when they have the data on that. Unfortunately, a lot of the claims that get made by, by you know, people like Donald Trump um, don't get rebuked. Like, political scientists don't do work on who killed Kennedy, so we can't mm -hmm. really go and answer that question. <laughs> um, I think there are other, other questions that, you know, because of the ideological tilt of academia, they don't get too much into it. So, for mm -hmm. instance, when Bernie Sanders says everything is rigged over and over again, when Elizabeth Warren gets up at the DNC and says rigged five times, uh, when Bernie Sanders says we've become an oligopoly, I mean, those, that's sort of inflamed rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that, that academics would say, no, we don't have 1% of people controlling a $20 trillion economy. That's just not true. But they should do that, and they don't. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe they could play a, a, a heightened role in pushing back on some of that, um, you know, some of that rhetoric on both sides. Hmm. I think uh, the last question I wanted to ask you is uh, probably on everybody's minds is how to, if you have specific strategies of how we spot um, fake news. So the fake news has gotten really smart. So they'll, they'll yeah. so, you know, like you'll get news from abc.com, but they'll have like abcc.com yeah. or abc.co, you know, so they try to trick you and they try to make it look real. Like that looks... Um, well, not the one, but the one before it with the zombie. I mean, that looked kind of real, except for the <laughs> zombie. Yeah, so, so they're pretty good at figuring out how to trick people. Like, they've gotten sophisticated because there's money to be made off of this. Like, they make money off of, uh, off of clicks. So, of uh, you know, people ask me, why do people believe in conspiracy theories? I like to turn the question around sometimes and say, how can you be a successful conspiracy theorist? You know, so if you put out mm -hmm. news that's designed for a particular um, partisan group, you know, it's going to sell. If you just get it into the, get it on Facebook and it'll start getting shared and you start making money off the, off the ad revenue. You know, so, so during the election when you had Republicans, you know, really having an intense hatred for Hillary Clinton, when you put anything out there that said, you know, she was taken off the debate stage in a stretcher and an oxygen mask, that get a ton of shares because Republicans wanted to hear that. You know, so play the right tune, send it at the right time, and, and you can make good money off of, uh, off of it. Don't do that. <laughs> but I'm just saying that's, that's, that's the business model. So if you want to spot it, you know, you just got to be thinking in your mind, is this too good to be true? <laughs> you know, if you really hate Hillary Clinton and you find out that she has a body double, you have to ask yourself, is that really true? <laughs> You know, as much as you want to believe it, it you know, you j just, j you know, just the same way if you were looking at a product in a store. You know, <laughs> if, it's, if it's too good to be true, don't buy it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. All right, so we open it up for questions from the audience, and we have two mics on each side. We'll take alternate questions from you. Hi guys. So um, I've noticed when you said that uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign made a conspiracy theory up about the uh, primary being rigged. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that because didn't we learn through the Podesta email leaks from WikiLeaks that there was indeed heavy favoritism during the primary and that uh, there were several examples of Debbie Wasserman Schultz playing, playing massively favoritized towards Hillary Clinton. Uh, and one of the most iconic ones that I can think of is the instance of when she went to MSNBC and 
specifically went to Morning Joe's employees and told them to take it easy on her or she'll go up to their boss. <laughs> Every conspiracy theory has some evidence in its favor. So, you know, would we say that the DNC primary was rigged against Bernie Sanders? I, I wouldn't say that. And if you were to look at the totality of the evidence, I, don't, I just don't think it's there. Is it the case that the DNC didn't want him to win? Oh, yeah. Is it the case that Washington Schultz um, scheduled primaries in a way that, you know, would give Bernie Sanders less visibility? Probably. I mean, putting him in on Saturday nights when nobody's, when nobody's watching, absolutely. And they had far fewer um, debates, too. So does that lead to rigged? No, probably not. Um, favoritism in a slight way. And I don't think the Podesta emails said, you know, we're going to throw votes in the river. You know, I mean, Bernie lost fair and, fair and square. Um, was the DNC sort of um, playing favorites? Yeah. But both can be true. Thanks. Um, so I guess my prime example would be going to um, UC Berkeley and talking about the coverage there during the riots. Um, and I, the media didn't really cover the fact that it was anarchists that led those riots. Um, that And do you think that the media may have some sort of um, responsibility in uh, Trump's presidency by not giving those like the full facts of things um, and oftentimes like they never really even CNN didn't say anything about the fact that it was anarchists that led that riot and so Trump was getting that information from the media so do you feel that that I guess I'm saying like the media takes responsibility in certain senses for the way that Trump sees the country or the way that he responds to things that's a really good question. The motivations of the media, certainly the goal is to present uh, an accurate portrayal of what takes place. This doesn't make it right, but that's often difficult to do. Often news reporters, organizations will frame stories in a way that is familiar to their viewers. And so by doing that, and we have a lot of evidence in major domestic and international events, the war in Iraq and others, that it, we don't get the full treatment. We don't get the entire picture because what is happening is the, the journalist, the news organization is trying to distill that information into a recognizable format. Whether that affects you know, Trump's view of America, I think it plays into, whenever you have information that comes out that is determined to be correct but wasn't reported by the media, it might fit into a conspiracy theory. It certainly perpetuates this lack of trust in the news media. And I think that's what the news media is really struggling with now. How do we maintain an objective voice? How do we play a, a vital role in our democracy when it seems to matter more, but we've always relied on these shortcuts to provide softball stories, entertainment, soft news, less investigative reporting. I think it's complicated, but I think it certainly, that sort of reporting fits into what Donald Trump is saying about the news media. Most people would recognize that media can do a better job. That just facilitates and, and perpetuates that lack of trust. So playing, playing right off of what he just said, you know, the media likes to put things into a story everyone can understand, and they like keeping it in a, in, they like the two-party story. They like conflict between the two parties. They don't understand the Green Party. They don't understand the Libertarians, and they don't even know what anarchists are. <laughs> so they're just not interested in anything outside of the two-party system, and the media sort of plays a role in perpetuating that. But, so, I, I don't know who's, you know, behind the black masks that they're all wearing, you know. Um, it's, I would assume it's anarchists. Um, but if you watch CNN and other news sources, there are a ton of conspiracy theories about this now. So CNN is sort of pushing the story. I think former Treasury Secretary Bob Reich went on and said, yeah, it was Milo who funded the, um, the protesters to go out and cause all the trouble um, to make it look like the left was doing it. And then on the right, you have news saying, oh, it was George Soros that's paying all the protesters to go out 
and uh, keep Milo from speaking. So there's conspiracy theories on both sides, and nobody's really quite sure what to make of these protests. Um, but you're right. I mean, the media should probably talk to some of the people in black and, you know, uh, probably give them some airtime so at least we know who they are and wh why they're doing what they're doing. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, first off, Dr. Isba Soa and Dr. Yashinsky, thank you so much for sharing your research and knowledge with us and taking your time uh, to be here with us. Um, one, the question I have is in regards to uh, what often is overlooked in the conflict between the media and the new Trump administration, which is the impact of the policies that the administration is putting forth and is currently being discussed by the media. Um, and this kind of comes uh, connects to the issue of identifying fake news and how we as individual voters, constituents, citizens talk to one another about these uh, highly salient policy issues. So, for instance, let's uh, considering like climate change as an issue. What's the what do you feel is the best way to kind of combat what many people perceive as a disconnect between like say the amount of evidence that supports one side of an argument over another? And do you think that the media is currently engaging in the best behavior to properly frame these kinds of disagreements amongst the constituencies in the country? Well, there is a tendency for media to present both sides, right? Even when both sides aren't equal, there's this formula. And I think that speaks directly to the climate change uh, issue. But there's still some legitimacy in that because regardless of whether the scientific community is clearly, uh, the consensus is clear on climate change. There are a number of constituents, legislators, who represent those constituents who also have doubts. So that feeds into the formula of media being able to still present it as both sides, right? The, the one of the major theories of news coverage is that journalists index their coverage to the prominent debate in Washington. And as long as there's a countervailing view, as long as former President Obama says climate change is happening and current President Donald Trump says it's not, you have a way to present that as a legitimate policy debate regardless of the, of the consensus in the scientific community. But I think this also speaks potentially to conspiracies in terms of what justifies not believing the truth or the facts related to climate change that there's some group in society that is trying to change you know, our energy preferences to benefit themselves at the expense of others. So a good question to ask here is how do people get their opinions about issues like this? And as a scientist, I would like to say, well, people sit down and read the scientific journals and look at what the scientific consensus is, but nobody does that. Um, so if you look at the issue of climate change, the people who believe in it didn't, don't do so because they read the journals and checked out the data. They do it because their, their trusted sources tell them that it's real. So if you listen to Obama and Nancy Pelosi and other Democratic leaders saying this is real and there's going to be serious consequence, then you believe it. But if you're a Republican, you don't believe what those people say. You believe what um, Senator Jim Imhoff says. He says it's the biggest hoax ever. And he proved this because he walked into the floor of the Senate with a snowball in April and said, here you go, it's cold out. <laughs> no climate change. So people listen to these cues. And if you go back uh, to the, to the mid-'80s, there wasn't as much polarization on this. But there's massive polarization now because elites are polarized, because the parties decided to take very different positions you have people now taking very different positions. People don't listen to scientists. They listen to their political leaders on this. And one thing I would say, too, is there's crazy on both sides. You know, so I've had students in my classes, you know, I asked them, you know, this is a macabre question, but, you know, what, what are you going to die of? And they said, climate change. And I said, you're not going to, like, what is it, going to come and get you? <laughs> Like, if, and if you really thought climate change was going to kill you, Miami's the last place you should be because we're, you know, supposed to be underwater in like two years. So um, there, there's bad thinking. There are people, I read articles from time to time in real news sources that say, you know, people are going to have fins and gills soon because of climate change. It's going to be like Kevin Costner in Waterworld. And no, that's way overblown, you know, so we can go overboard on both sides. When Obama went to France and gave a speech about 
about climate change, she said, you know, you go down to Miami and just on a regular day, the fish are swimming through the streets. No, there are no fish swimming through the streets ever. And it just aggravated me so much that he was able to get away with this. And I emailed the fact checkers. I said, you got to fact check this. And they said it was half true. And I was pulling my hair out. And their reason for saying half true was somebody somewhere saw a fish in the street. But I'm like, I'm on South Beach all the time. There's no fish, even when it rains. You know, so th there's misstatements on both sides. Obviously, the other side is wrong. They just, they're not agreeing with science. But the other side needs to pull back some of their claims that are wrong because it's not helping their cause. Well, so everybody, everybody knows they're in the wrong camp. <laughs> Ebola is going to get Yeah, the Ebola is going to get them. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have a comment on the uh, conspiracy theory uh, part. So you've made a very strong statement about cons people who believe in some of the conspiracy theories as losers. Um, I want to say that I don't believe in 80% of the conspiracy theories, like the examples of like the Ebola or like the fish in the street or so. But obviously there are facts and things that happen, and they do need more of a logical understanding and a logical explanation. For example, when we talk about 9-11 and the World Trade Tower, what would be a logical explanation of Larry Silver's team buying terrorism insurance just a few months before the towers got hit? And why would the United States go after the after Iraq and the Iraqi government in the in the time that no single hijacker was from Iraq? They were all from Saudi Arabia and Emirates and Egypt and Lebanon. Now, when we talk about Saudi Arabia, you know the whole deal with the petrodollar and the United States currency being backed by oil instead of gold and silver, and when Nixon changed all of that. So would you really still call people who believe in that as losers and people who ask, so why did you go after Iraq and destabilize the whole Middle East for people that never committed that crime and never killed the 3,000 people at the, at the towers? So that's a question from somebody who's like a Middle Eastern American, and I'm just curious to know what you think, what do you think about that? Would you call people who believe in that as losers or follow that logic as losers do? So you're Middle Eastern American, and what you're saying is that the that the towers were not brought down by Middle Easterners, as, as the theory it says. It was brought down by Middle Eastern terrorists. Oh, but, okay. the, but the details are pretty vague, that we still don't know, um, you know, as if the United States government knew that it was going to happen, but they took advantage of it, or that actually it did happen. But, but, but that's not my question, whether the United States did it or the terrorists did it. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that al-Qaeda did it. But okay. why would the United States go after Iraq? when not one single hijacker was from Iraq. I think my answer to that is Saddam Hussein being backed by the United States government during the Iraq-Iran war in the 80s and him being you know, you know, funded and supported by a lot of mass destruction weapons that the United States wanted to take out of Iraq or claim that they were in Iraq. Would you, would you relate something like that to that? Oh, I, I, I lost you a little bit in there. Yeah. I mean, I, the thing with conspiracy theories or any theories is that they are theories, and you try to find the best theory to explain what happened. And I, I appreciate what you're saying because there seem to be some inconsistencies. But I would argue, as a as a scholar of the the presidency, that what happened in the invasion of the in in the Iraq War was a breakdown in the White House advisory system. Mm -hmm. That the voices that would have discouraged that invasion were excluded from that conversation, and it became sort of a groupthink. This happened also uh, the, um, uh, the Persian Gulf War, and the United States saw Saddam Hussein amassing forces on the Kuwaiti border, mm -hmm. and the George H.W. Bush White House just didn't see it that way because it was completely antithetical to their worldview. They had no thought that Saddam Hussein was crazy in that way. From 1990 or from 1989, yeah, from 1989, all the way to 2001, why would they go after Saddam Hussein in 2003 after, from eight, 1989 or 1990, all they waited until 2003 to go after Saddam Hussein when their major catas catastrophe took over in the United States? Mm -hmm. Why would they go after Iraq? Yeah, well, again, I would say that was a failure of the, the White House assessing the right. evidence correctly. Okay. Thank right, you. So for the mm -hmm. sake of... Yeah, I think you had a, a first question about why I use the word losers. And, yes. and I, I don't use it in a pejorative sense. I use it in yes. a descriptive sense. Mm -hmm. So conspiracy theories are about power, who has it, and what they're doing with it. And they tend to resonate most when it's a group that 
is out of power accusing a group that's in power. Mm -hmm. So if we take the theories that you're propagating about... Um, you, I'm you just know, asking we're, why. I'm not, you know, I'm which, not, which are right. generally called 9-11 truth. I mean, those were very popular in during the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. You know, if, and if you follow Google Trends, you look at how many times people were looking up 9-11 truth or, you know, 9-11 conspiracy theory. There's a lot of that happening in the Bush administration, and they were very salient at that time. But once Bush left power and Obama came in, 9-11 truth theories sort of became ir very much irrelevant. And mm -hmm. they weren't so much on people's minds anymore. Instead, the focus became on Republicans thinking that Obama had faked the birth certificate or blew up the Deepwater Horizon well or killed the kids at Sandy Hook or killed Scalia. So I'm not saying that any conspiracy theory is wrong. You may absolutely be correct. You know, it's not what I argue. It's just what when I say that conspiracy theories are for losers is that they tend to resonate when it's people who lose something, people who are out of power mm -hmm. tend to use them, um, not the people who are in power. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Two more questions. Oh, perfect. All right. Uh, thank you guys again. This is a really cool opportunity. I want to know, as I'm a communications major and somebody in media, so this is fun, but uh, what are your guys' thoughts on political polarization as it has become more kind of, it seems, dynamic that, especially on the radical fringes of each party, it's you're either with us or you're a fascist, or you're either with, with us or you're a fascist. It's kind of both ways. Like, what role does, I, I think Joe kind of touched on it, like people being in their bubbles play in both the Trump administration communicating to the media and then the people in general, and then in general people's understanding of things such as fake news? Well, partisan, partisanship generally, but also the effects of partisan news is a is a is a hot topic in political science. And there are different views on this, whether partisan media has caused greater partisanship or partisans are self-selecting into those uh, Fox News or MSNBC. It's somewhat distressing because the, the, uh, the authors, uh, their study that I'm thinking of, uh, it's changing channels, changing minds, changing channels, I think it's what it's called. Uh, they, um, one of the sort of the, the beliefs is that if you expose yourself to different information, you'll be more moderate, right? You'll understand different points of view and you'll embrace a variety of different perspectives. But what they found instead is that if you're a conservative and watch a liberal channel, you'll become more conservative and vice versa. So unfortunately, they're saving grace in terms of the deleterious effects of partisanship and partisan media in our society is that it's only a small percent of Americans that actually pay attention to partisan news, that Fox News Channel only gets about three million viewers in prime time every night. It's somewhat, I mean, it's, it's unfulfilling in some ways, but for somebody who always advocates participation in democracy and voting, their conclusion is that we should be thankful that most Americans don't care enough to be partisan, <laughs> and so we're somewhat <laughs> insulated from this being a, a worse problem than it actually is. Thank you. Um, my question is for Mr. Espa. You touched on how people tend to gravitate more towards entertaining news and find policy a bit boring. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, do you think if people cared more about policy rather than entertaining soft news, that there would be a better relationship between the president and the media as well as the public and the media? And how do you think that would change news? Yeah, well, one of the motivations of news is is the profit, right? So who's watching the audience? So absolutely, if you all showed an interest in policy and you demanded more policy discussion from news, then I think they would respond in kind. I, I think that there are opportunities in the fragmented media world that we live in that, you know, a enterprising network, maybe CBS, which appears to be more hard news oriented than the other networks, uh, maybe one of the cable channels can actually try to target that group of American citizens that are interested in policy and give them more of what they want. Because there is a tendency, if you turn on the Today Show in the morning and you see laptops blowing up, you know, that might be entertaining, but it's not necessarily worth your time if you're a busy person. I, I think it would fundamentally change how we debate and consider policy if media covered policy more substantively and at the same time 
citizens were more engaged and interested in that. But it has to work both ways. Unless we have a BBC model of news, people will opt out of that. Hard news channels will lose viewers, it will be a failed business model, and they'll go back to giving us clips of kitty cats. I did a, I did a study a couple years, I co-authored a study a couple years ago um, about dogs in the media and how much coverage do dogs get in mainstream news. And what we found was that um, when an event in the New York Times was covered with a dog, it was three and a half times more likely to be picked up in a local paper than a similar event that didn't have a dog. So when the Supreme Court put, put out a case that was a um, search and seizure case, it got very little dispersion to local papers, but when it put out a search and sniff case, where the dog was doing the searching with, with its nose, it got three and a half times more papers picking it up. <laughs> the irony was after the paper came out, now th this is sort of astonishing to me because nobody really cares about political science journals. Nobody reads them, nobody looks at them, they don't get any media coverage. I've come to grips with this. Um, the study came out, the day it came out, um, the journal just tweeted it. And I got a call from NBC that night and said, we want to do a story about your study. So NBC with Brian Williams did a story, a three-minute segment on the study. And it was all just pictures of dogs. <laughs> and what the producers said during the study was, you know, we're incredibly guilty of this. And they did a list of all the stories they'd done in the past years. If you go look up NBC and put in dogs, you'll find tons of stories. The dog that surfs, the dog that talks, the dog that says, I love you. And so I think this is the first political science study to ever get coverage on a, on a, on a, on a broadcast network. I was like, holy moly. Um, and then the next day, the Atlantic, the Boston Globe, and the Washington Post all picked it up. So it just sort of reinforced the idea that dogs get tons of media coverage. And if you write a, you write a paper about a dog, you'll get coverage. So maybe political scientists should just start doing stuff about dogs. Um, so I think that sort of gets to your question is that Dogs sell because people like them, and hard news outlets put in, put in stuff with dogs. When Katrina happened, I mean, a day after a day after it happened, they started writing stories. What about the dogs in the shelters? There's people dying on the roofs, but they said, "What about the dogs?" And it sort of makes sense from a profit <coughs> motive because the idea is that if you are writing to some person in upstate New York who doesn't really care about the thing going on, you know, two thousand miles away. And they see, oh, dogs. That catches their attention. So that's why they do it. And it sounds bad, but it's sort of good in the sense that it can pull in those viewers. You know, I don't really care about policy, but I love dogs. So I will find out more about Katrina just because the word dog drawed me in. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be quick. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. OK. Um, so. Um, from uh, all that you've said, um, I want to add, and I have a question re relating to that. Part of the distrust um, that the public has for media is not just, um, you know, s fake news from fake websites, but also the fact that um, so-called reputable websites do um, present falsehoods, like you admitted. But not just that, but the fact that you do see over and over again where news is being presented by this supposedly credible news website with their skew on what they want um, you to take from it. You know, they either edit out some of the facts or they go on to add other things to just, you know, color it their way. Now, um, as an independent, watching over the years and each election cycle, one of the things that started to disgust me as the years went by was looking at the so-called fact checkers and observing that the fact checkers were really false. Um, and I did my own personal you know, study. And I just uh, saw a few weeks back a study by uh, the George Mason University where um, I watch this debate from beginning to end. I note what each candidate is saying. Some I'm knowledgeable about. And I'm like, no, this is not right. This is not right. And they're like multiple. And then at the end of the day, um, I go to USA Today or Washington Post and look at their fact checkers. And I see that consistently, you know, there is, let's say, 12 
uh, comments by Republicans and probably all of them are absolutely wrong or Pinocchio or what so. And then you find only four comments from Democrats. And usually it's kind of somewhat correct, absolutely correct, or um, like the example that you mentioned, oh, fish used to swim across the road in <laughs> Miami and someone once saw it, so it is partially correct. And it's, it just beats one's imagination of rationality in that judgment. Because uh, in the course of that debate, Please get to your question. Okay. That'd be great. So, what can be done to um, hold fact checkers accountable or to hold both the academic scientific community or journalists to use the same standard for this side as well as the other side fairly? What can be done about that? So the fact checkers are not perfect, and I've, I've been studying them for a while. I think fact checking is a great thing, and we need more of it, but we also need it to be done better, as you say, um, because they, they are often sometimes wrong. Um, so one example was, well, I'll give you two very quick examples. The lie of the year in 2012 was that Mitt Romney said that Jeep was moving some, Chrysler was moving some Jeep production to China. Turned out to be true, but that was the lie of the year. And then in 2013, the lie of the year was uh, from Barack Obama, if you want your health care, you could keep it. They originally said it was half true, but then with the, with the politics that happened later, when it turned out it was not really true at all, they had to say it was the biggest lie of the year. So they're not always right, and they should be better, um, but, the, but the idea of them doing it is a, is a good thing, and we need to hold them accountable too. And thank you to our speakers. Small.